So five meshes can realize 85% of the reduction potential in greenhouse gas emissions of the model Germany. And six meshes account for 70% of the resource consumption potential. I think before we started the model, we were thinking that those are the measures that have the greatest impact. But um, I think how much impact they have compared to all the recycling um, measures or the technical measures, I think, was quite a uh, quite a surprise. guest here with me so we're ready to roll welcome to the circular coffee break podcast where we will be casually talking about everything circular and beyond now my guest today is jonas echner senior project manager circular economy at wwf germany among many other things jonas has been involved in developing the circular economy model germany that we will be talking about later in this episode I'm looking forward to discussing this and many other topics around circular economy and the activities of WWF Germany today. Welcome to the show, Jonas. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> really happy to have you here. As, as I mentioned before we pressed record, I've, I've really been reading through the, the circular economy uh, model Germany and been looking into that in, in detail. So really looking forward to jump into that in more detail. But to get us started... Could you maybe introduce yourself briefly and share a bit about your role and your work at WWF Germany, particular in relation to circular economy initiatives? Sure. Yeah, good to get started. I think my first connection uh, with circular economy uh, was during my bachelor's uh, Now, over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. um, we had some uh, external speakers talking about circular economy, and I was just fascinated about this concept, no waste, to not have, it just made sense. Now, this whole discussion uh, around circular economy has changed more towards less unnecessary products or less unnecessary consumption, and I'm super happy mm -hmm. about this momentum. I... Then had my professional contact with circular economy um, during my time at UNDP in Laos, where we uh, where I supported the development of a strategy for the government there. And after I changed to uh, WWF Germany, I heard about this pioneering study, uh, the circular economy model Germany, and I was just super excited to get involved into this uh, this study and change to the circular economy team and. This is what we did kind of last year. And at the moment, um, we are trying to make most out of the findings and getting all the findings implemented. Great. And you mentioned uh, already WWF has been actively working on circular economy concepts. Um, what motivated WWF to develop the circular economy model Germany? And what were the key questions addressed in the model during the study that you have been conducting? So with the start of our current government, um, we managed to get the development of a national circular economy strategy in the coalition agreement, WWF, together with uh, different environmental NGOs in Germany. And this was a big step. And we all knew and thought circular economy is a very important lever Uh, for the environment and for people, um, that there's a lot of potential uh, in this entire circular economy space. But we didn't know how much uh, positive impact there is, uh, any trade-offs, what are more important measures, what should we prioritize on. on. And this was the entire idea behind the circular economy model Germany. We wanted to dig deep into different sectors. So to find out what sectors have the big impact, what measures in these sectors, what's more important, which kind of activities do we go more into rethinking, reduction, sufficiency activities or measures, or do we go more in recycling where, where is the, the power of circular economy? Mm -hmm. And finally, we wanted to know how to translate this into policy 
in Germany. So to link it to this development of the national circular economy strategy for Germany and like show uh, show our government and the Ministry of Environment where where they should focus and how to get this impact done. Interesting. And, and you mentioned the correlation between the different areas and, and the different sectors and the different industries. And the model actually emphasizes the holistic approach of circular economy as, as we're talking about a systemic change of basically the, the whole economic model that, that you have in the country, including interactions, central indicators, and, and so on and so forth. Could you maybe explain a little bit the importance of these aspects and how they contribute to the success of the circular economy initiative. So what's the importance of these correlations of the different stakeholders of all of that coming together into one single model? So this is actually the niche or the added value where we saw our work from WWF contributing to this. We wanted this, what you mentioned, holistic approach to a circular economy. So to move away from this waste-driven circular economy, from measures in this area, focusing on technological solutions, focusing on recycling, we wanted to move up the hierarchy in the 10 circular economy R's, or how how we say it in, uh, at, at WWF, reduce, re reduce the resource streams. And actually, this is where I think most impact is the rethinking part of the circular economy. It's challenging, but I see that there is most potential. So do we think mobility or do we think cars? Do we think um, or how can we make our living and working space uh, more effectively? Or other questions like, Do we need all the decorative lamps that we have around us that are glued together and super hard to recycle? So we wanted to integrate all these different hierarchies in the model to be also be able to showcase where should the priority lie and where where is most impact coming from. And we define for most sectors, like all, all these kind of, uh, of measures in the very beginning, and uh, went back to, to interviews, uh, invited experts to kind of analyze um, which measures are more, more important, what measures specifically we, sh we should look at um, moving on in, in the model. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And the sector selection and the example measures are actually a, a very important part of the model. Can you maybe provide some insights into how the sectors were chosen? You already alluded to it a little bit uh, just now and basically discuss any specific measures that you have been particular that have been particularly impactful uh, that you've been looking at. Uh, sure. So as a base, we were most interested to uh, look at the consumption in Germany. Uh, including investments in Germany. So let's say consumption over time. And the sectors were selected based on a ranking um, in, in this consumption, looking at the main indicators that we were interested in throughout the model uh, uh, in, in general. So greenhouse gas emission, resource depletion, uh, land use as the the big environmental indica indicators. And by looking at those, uh, we were able to, to find out which sectors currently have most impact and that should be addressed in, uh, in, a, in a circular economy in Germany uh, as well. Another thing that's, uh, that was of great interest for us was what products and in the end materials have most environmental impact. So we, one thing that we wanted to know is also how can a circular economy in Germany support the economic systems? So how mm. can we um, reduce some critical raw materials, for example, 
Um, so uh, the circular economy contributes to the economy uh, in, in the future. And for the selection of this, we, for example, also analyze future technologies and studied relevant products and services with high environmental impact. So in the end, we came down with a list of nine sectors that was the base to develop measures in each sector and that then was used to calculate and model the impact on the main main indicators that we look at in the model Germany. And there we not only look at environmental indicators like the ones I mentioned, greenhouse gas emission, land use uh, and uh, resource consumption, raw material consumption, but we also look at social indicators, for example, labor needs or gross value add in Germany. Um, but we also look at the impact on strategical and environmental raw materials, uh, so how we can reduce um, the need for those. That's, that's a very interesting topic, because I think what we're seeing, and <clears throat> I think we hear the discussion around the batteries and that we will not have enough raw materials to create all the batteries we will be needing for, for e-mobility and all the other electrification that we're looking at. But we're seeing something similar in a lot of very other industries where, where critical raw materials will be scarce going forward. So it's interesting that, that you're also looking at these, I, I would argue, more economic aspects of circular economy. And I think at the end of the day, they need to support each other in order for the model to work uh, at, at, the, at the end of the day. Um, who, who were the, the parties you worked with in that context to understand the different sectors, the different industries? What, what stakeholders have you, have you been engaging with in developing the model? Um, so this uh, study was done together with Fraunhofer Institute, Öko Institute and Freie Universität Berlin, uh, one of the universities here in Berlin, who have deep knowledge in uh, or deep expertise uh, in the different fields that we needed. So expertise, for example, in Uh, circular economy and what measures are most important. Fraunhofer is very good at modeling and mm. uh, Freie Universität Berlin, uh, our, our colleague there, was very close to resource policy in Germany and kind of knew uh, the narrative at the moment, was able to suggest different uh, policy instruments. Um, and together, I think we were quite a diverse and strong consortium to Uh, to write this study. Interesting. And I mean, one, one of the central findings, I, I guess, that you could take out of the study, out of the model, is that sufficiency is by far the most effective strategy. Maybe not necessarily that surprising, but were there any surprising insights or confirmations that emerged from the research that you, when, when you looked at all of this in, in all that detail. And I'm sure there's much more detail that goes into it than the study and, and the publication that you can actually find on the on the webpage. But any insights, any topics you saw where you said like, okay, this this is an aspect that, that is really interesting or provides a new perspective there. So generally speaking, um, when looking at the sector, so the narrative of this study is actually How many resources do we need in each sector today? How many resources or um, greenhouse gas emissions are emitted in 2045 as we, if we continue as planned? And what does the mo model support? Like how many uh, greenhouse gas emissions or how many resources do we need less if we implement all measures? And it's already interesting to see the ranking between the different sectors. Uh, generally speaking, we can say uh, we can save around uh, a quarter, so 25% over a quarter um, in uh, in resource use, greenhouse gas emission uh, for land use change. It's act or for land use needed, uh, uh, it's actually reduced by 30%. These are like this is good data, but I think. For me personally, most interesting was what are the most important measures by itself. 
And there we can take, for example, five measures that have most impact in greenhouse gas emissions. And these are, as you mentioned, all sufficiency based, which I think is super interesting. We look at reducing or more effective usage of our living and working space, uh, using less cars by, for example, using more public transport, um, using car sharing, using carpooling um, services, moving towards a planetary health diet, which means, in other words, eating less meat or uh, less milk and cheese, less products like these, more resource efficient servers, server, server centers, and less textile cons consumption by losing what we have longer and using different approaches like, for example, product as a service, like sharing initiatives in the textile space. On the other hand, if we, if we look at uh, resource, uh, raw material consumption, cars and living space or living and working space is up there again. Textile consumption is up there again. Mm -hmm. Cement recycling has, has great, great potential. And uh, server centers, again, is up there. So five measures can realize 85% of the reduction potential in greenhouse gas emissions of the model Germany. And six measures account for 70% of the resource consumption potential. I think before we started the model, we were thinking that those are the measures that have the greatest impact. But um, I think how much impact they have compared to all the recycling um, measures or the technical measures, I think was quite a, uh, quite a surprise um, for me. And we learned a lot from these findings and they also triggered very important discussions. And I, this was, was a big learning for me during the model as well. Because if we talk about showcasing our government that less cars is the, is the solution in the mobility space, in the car and battery space. Um, there's a lot of discussions around this car. Is a, uh, Germany is a car country. Yeah? You have to argue it well. So the government is on board to kind of implement measures that support this, this change, this transformation. And especially when you have an industry sector um, like the car sector in Germany, where a lot, a lot of jobs are linked to, um, you are completely in the space of just transition, like we know from the whole uh, climate change discussion. There is a lot of transformation of our economy um, ahead of us if we want to really go down the circular economy path. And it needs to be accompanied by good policy so people don't lose motivation to follow down this um, path. On the other hand, so this is like the role of policy, I think, in the role of us as WWF uh, talking to our policymakers. On the other hand, if we talk about the big impact of sufficiency-based measures, um, there is a lot of behavior change activities needed it's a big decision or it's, it's a big change if you rent clothing or if you own clothing, if you need a hole in your wall and you go to the super, to the, uh, to the store and buy a drill, um, it's easy. That's, that's the behavior we know. And we kind of lost track of ringing the bell on our neighbor's door, asking them for a drill or looking for a rental option it's just it's just easier to do this this consumption that we are used to so this behavior change part is what got me thinking most after we finished the model germany and now a last a last point related to sufficiency how do we get companies on board and how do we get them ready you can't just say Hey guys, you, you need to produce less. You need mm. to have answers so they are ambitious and motivated to kind of follow this path towards a holistic circular economy. 
Yeah, and I, I think you're making a couple of really important points there. Because at the end of the day, as, as we talked briefly earlier, it's a systemic change. It's a major change we're talking about. In some areas, it will be easier. In other areas, it will be more difficult. But in order to really arrive at a circular economy model Germany, you need to make all of these changes because they are interrelated, one pace into the other. Um, you already mentioned that a little bit. Let me maybe follow up there a, a bit. How have you been using the information from the circular economy model Germany study? And what are the concrete steps that need to happen from your point of view so that this information can actually be used and be leveraged to drive that change, be it on the consumer side, be it on the in the public side, or be it on the side of, of companies, of corporations. Yeah, and now we reached uh, my today's business, let's say, as um, <laughs> we really want to use these findings and mm -hmm. move towards this holistic uh, circular economy. I think there's different uh, parts to it. One thing is this, Transform transformation or our idea of how we live and consume. How, how do we move this forward in our society? And I want to connect this maybe first to this, to sharing. I like challenges and we focused on one hand that there is a lot of Im impact in sharing activities Just as an example, if three people share a car, you need two less. If three people or five people share a drill, um, you need four less. But the challenge here is market penetration. So it's a big change for people to think in this different way. When I run out of butter, I, I don't know why, yeah? It's easier for me to make the long way to the next supermarket just for some more butter than to knock on my neighbor's door. Oh, where's this coming from? And this is, I think, a big thing that we need to, to address and to make it easier for people as well. Same for long living products. How can we consume in a different way buying products that we use as long as possible. And one thing that I always have to think in uh, about in this space is Bauhaus. Bauhaus, like this initiative of architecture and furniture and all of this, it's a hundred years old. Products are still hip and cool. Products are minimalistic. Products uh, are long living. They have good quality. And if you want to buy one today, you pay a whole lot of money. How, how can we move towards this? How we, can we use this knowledge and use it for the creation of, no, of, of the new products that we produce? Um, and in this regard, since one of the findings was actually using products longer and sharing products in the ICT, so in the information and communication sector, in the furniture sector, and in the textile sector. That's the big, that's the, the big impact measures. Mm -hmm. So for these three sectors and for these two activities, sharing and uh, using longer repair, all of this, we are in the second round of a project proposal, and I hope we can start uh, mid-next year with this project. So this is one thing that we follow on. And another thing that's been on my mind since Model Germany is this seven-ton target. So one thing that we ask politics and society and, uh, and companies, that we need a society, a consumption of seven tons re raw materials per capita, so per person, per year. At the moment in Germany, as an example, we are at 16 How do we get this um, as a priority up, like the 1.5 degree, but also how can we communicate this in the society without people being afraid, oh, now you want to take me away my car and now you want to take me away my holidays, my summer holidays. 
Um, so finding good solutions, and I think there is potential in circular economy to find uh, a life, find lives with a similar quality of life within this seven ton ratio per year. So uh, communicating this and having having solutions, having answers on hand when people ask you and how should we achieve this. Uh, and this is actually another project we are working on at the moment. We started now by looking for data to go away from this average seven ton, seven ton average, and kind of uh, define different ways of life, um, moving away from an average, but having different personas uh, and examples, and then asking people in Germany, hey, what what measures uh, are you okay to change in your daily life? What are you okay with? What do we not even need to talk about anymore? And where are you, your red lines, your no-go lines? Um, and hopefully by the end of 2025, we have a good set uh, of measures and ideas that we can use for uh, our policy work, uh, for our communication um, in this regard. And last but not least, one important thing um, that I think will move circular economy uh, forward and the seven ton goal forward is in Germany, we are now in the last steps of our national circular economy strategy. And one big ask and one thing that we've been working uh, on a lot is to have some kind of target on resource consumption in this strategy. And at the moment, there is a eight-ton goal in there. And this is something that should definitely stay in there. This would be super important um, to have this target setting in Germany. We are not the, the first ones in Germany to have this. There's different countries around um, but I think we need to follow track. And the cherry on the cake uh, for the next years would be if the government could commit to a specific legal framework for this uh, resource target, uh, maybe in form of a resource conservation law to really get ambitious and move towards a holistic circular economy. Cool. It sounds, sounds, sounds really good. And I, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, a lot of the things you referred to Bauhaus, which is a mindset of longevity, basically, from minimalistic longevity. And I think there's a lot of things that we actually don't need to learn, but we need to relearn. We need to rediscover them. If, if I think back, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years it was completely normal to repair things. It was completely normal to borrow things from your neighbor. It was completely normal to do these things, but we have unlearned them over the years. So as you said, it's easier to go to the to the market, to the to the shop to buy things than to borrow them. And I think it's it's relearning uh, these type of things. Now, unfortunately, the coffee is empty and it's time to wrap up this episode of the Circular Coffee Break. But before we close, Jonas, before I let you go, um, let's maybe have a look into the future. Um, if we would meet again in, let's say, one to two years, what would be the main things that you think should have happened, would have happened, based on all the different projects, the initiatives that you have outlined, that you're working on, that you're building on top of the circular economy model Germany? And what is the what is the North Star that you would like to see happen in Germany in two years, maybe, um, with regards to the circular economy? I think a big lever is a uh, policy so i'd be happy if we have an ambitious uh, national circular economy strategy in germany um, and the government and also the next government we have in elections next year is committed uh, to follow this path so that we manage to keep the momentum up and also manage to have some agenda setting around this seven ton or maybe eight ton uh, resource consumption target and that people are not afraid to move on this topic. This would be the star uh, on the heaven. And I think those co communication activities that we have around this is kind of feeding feeding into um, this seven ton, ton target. 
not not to say that the work on longevity and repair and all of this is super important i think these behavior change aspects like you mentioned making it people easier to do what we actually always did so yeah maybe in two years uh this project is up and running and we were able to inspire some people to do what we always did and what is actually more sustainable moving away from fast consumption Perfect. Thanks a lot, Jonas, for joining me today. Really interesting topic. And I think we could have talked for another half hour easily. So maybe we'll we'll revisit the topic in a year's time to see how all of these different strings and activities have, have been leading to, to concrete results. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> And for all of you uh, out there listening, if you haven't looked into the circular economy model Germany yet, you can find that on the webpage of WWF Germany. And we will also link um, the, the documents in the show notes so that you can have a look. It's a, it's a really interesting and really insightful read. Um, and I think it's not only a model for Germany, but it's a model for every single country, basically, uh, naturally with, with uh, customizations here and there. But I think it gives a very good blueprint on what are the main topics. Um, we hope you found today's episode interesting and inspiring and uh, maybe got some new ideas on the topic of circular economy. If you like the podcast, you can help us growing the circular coffee break community by giving us a five-star rating and a positive review on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you find your podcasts also um, as the episodes drop every two weeks please remember to subscribe to stay in the loop on the latest episodes uh, with great guests The only thing left for me is to thank all of you for joining us today, for listening, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all here at the Circular Coffee Break podcast. Mm -hmm.